Hody, Hody went into it like I went into this topic thinking there's white genocide going on in South Africa. Yep. And, you know, you read Trump's tweet, and it's basically like uh, there's mass mass uh, land being stolen, whites are being killed, and it's genocide is happening. Mm-hmm. That's not the case. As mo- as with most Donald Trump tweets, that, that isn't exactly what happened. But he did put it on a spotlight that, that it hadn't. This South African crisis has been kind of bubbling under the radar on, you know, sort of the alt-right, the Alex Jones world, the uh, in, into some of the new right. And uh, all the way, you know, people like Lauren Southern, for instance, have been doing documentaries on new- on YouTube about it, which I watched, and it was fine. And it's there's some really interesting um, information in it. But the premise, according to what is actually what what you can kind of find in terms of statistics, it seems pretty flawed. So, do you know anything about what's going on in South Africa? Yeah, I mostly just looked at honestly, like I haven't looked at the South African farmer crisis since what, 2012. That's how long this farmer violence has been going on. Oh, because, really? Yeah, it's been going on for decades. See, I did not know that. Yeah, it's like, that's what it, like, it was kind of weird, like, so, I, when I first saw the tweet, I go like, yeah, thanks for bringing attention to this. This has been going on, I don't know about the race thing, but, you know, this has been going on for a long time. Right. Well, just violence in South Africa, period, but yeah, direction directed just towards farmers and landowners, mostly. Okay. So what's, let's talk about the crisis um, and why is this crisis happening? And in, in really one word, it's colonialism. Mm-hmm. Um, you have whites moving. Now, some people, are, some people in South Africa um, claim that certain parts of Africa that are now being held by white landowners were never occupied by tribal black tribesmen at all. And they went in and they homesteaded it, mm-hmm. and so now they're wrongly being persecuted. And then others claim that this was all tribal land, and that whites came in and basically settled over over the course of the colonial era in South Africa, mainly the the Boers and and the English and the Dutch and and everybody. So they the definition of colonialism accurately sums up the story of Africa's. South Africa's history when it states that colonialism is the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically. And by that definition, there is no doubt that that's what happened to most African countries and to to a large extent South American countries over the past, you know, 600 years, I would say. That's uh, fair. Yeah. If you well, like for uh, Europeans, and then the middle, a um, lot of the tribes in the Middle East came before that, also. Right. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, because like just like Europe had their dark ages, Africa also went to the dark ages, and they got invaded by a lot of the Middle East, and that's you know destroyed a lot of different things, and they were trying to recover from that, and yeah. So sorry. That's all. I'm no, you're you're still good. There. So. While you know the the colonial argument has gone on forever, uh, the law that actually took the land and codified it into law is only about a hundred years old. It's it's this is from Bloomberg, under the rule of European colonialists, uh, South Africa's Native Lands Act of 1913 stripped most black people of their right to own property, a policy reinforced decades later by the National Party and its system of apartheid or apartness. A government land audit released in February showed that farms and agricultural holdings comprised 97% of the 121.9 million hectares of the nation's area. So farms and agricultural holdings are 97% of the land in South Africa. So it is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a lot of land. And that whites own 72% of the 37 million hectares held by individuals. This tallies with the results of a separate audit released November 1st by the Agri-Development Solutions and farm lobby group AGRISA, which found non-whites own 27% of the nation's farmland, compared with 14% in 1994. And uh, from The Independent, according to official data, black South Africans directly own just 1.2% of the country's rural land. White South Africans own 23%, while the remainder is held by private enterprise. A survey by City Press in 2017 suggested that when those private enterprises are taken into account, the arable land owned by white people rises to 73%. 
So it's clearly an overwhelming majority of the land is owned by whites mm -hmm. in a country that is largely African, well, African American and Harry, <laughs> um, <laughs> and black. Um, so there has been obviously progress over the last 24 years, but uh, people have been able to see the the suffering that's gone on and uh it's it's worth quickly examining the difference in the plight between the descendants of natives in south africa and the descendants of slaves here in the u.s black people in america are still catching up socially and there's still some ironing out that's been done in the last century be that as as it may a black person here can still work hard overcome adversity by the power of community and willpower and catch up and surpass someone who has a heritage of superiority over their heritage that's written by hody a researcher now um, if if you look at the timelines, you know we're we're really talking about obviously black Americans in the South. Obviously, there were large percentages of blacks in the North who were free, but still faced a lot of uh, racial oppression uh, even up until the seventies. Mm -hmm. You know, the the seventies it, it seems like was probably the best time to be a black person in America because. You had the civil rights era, and you had a lessening, and you had more freedom, and then all of a sudden the drug war starts in the 80s, and that completely decimates the black community here in America. Uh, and, and obviously not in every case. I mean, the, we're making sweeping general, general, generalizations here. Thank you. But um, compared to South Africa, where really apartheid wasn't opened up until the mid-90s, 1994, yeah. I believe. So, so obviously... Uh, Black Americans have had a longer period of time of readjustment, mm -hmm. but there still is obviously if you if you look at the state of the black community in in a large portion of areas where they make up a percentage, for instance, in inner cities like Chicago, mm -hmm. it's still a very difficult position for Black Americans to be in. Correct. Yes, a um, lot of it comes from different um, systematic things that are just uh, trailovers from the. Um, uh, Jim Crow. Yeah, Jim Crow, thank you. The Jim Crow era, like a lot of licensing, why it's, it's so hard to start, they made it so hard to start businesses, so like the government licensing for different businesses. Um, the other one is just with education um, and the way that the public school system has been wrecked. And the other thing is just um, economic and economic policies um, from good and well-meaning liberals holding back minority communities inside of inner cities. Give, a, give me an example. The idea of the, um, what everyone likes to go for is like the welfare state, stuff like that. It's the, it's the idea that um, the government will provide if you cannot provide yourself. It's a great noble cause that some people are willing to help out in charity. But right. this enforced forced charity has no teeth mechanisms to it. So right. if you abuse this you wouldn't get on this system like if it was from a church or stuff like that they would you know they'd, there'd be someone there to like no no you're abusing the system or no you willfully did this to get on said system and you're gaming the system there's no real in a church they have like mechanism to go after that because it's you know they're voluntary doing this and the welfare system and the government don't have that type of system so you have that so you have uh, the community basically having the man took taken out of the household splitting up the black family uh, to allow for these welfare programs to come into and making it hard to get off that because if a man did come back into the in the life and get back in the uh, into the family if they didn't make enough the welfare dollars were more or slightly more on the other hand than the black man could bring into so breaking up the family and as we know one of the key factors to you know, not be poor in America is, you know, ha two family, a uh, two parent household, you know, finish high school, you know, and have kids once you're married. The, right. You know, these fact, these key factors here that, you know, they're very simple, very straightforward, but these help, you know, keep families out of poverty. And it seems like each one of these, you know, foundations of like basically the American family or, or just human society of households or just being attacked by well, um, un, un, unintended consequences of these well-meaning liberals. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in Africa, I'm sure that is it is even tougher. I mean, now that, um, you know, when you when you really think about it in terms of history, 1994 is is only 21 you know you, you're talking about if you're born in 1998 you're 20 now yeah <laughs> you know like yeah. 
So we're not talking, uh, we're talking a couple decades. And mm-hmm. then, you know, and just in America, in the way that over the long, you know, and so when people talk about white privilege, I, 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 I've been so excited to do the shows this week. And, and I had a conversation with somebody who is, who was arrested as a teenager recently, a uh, very young person. Mm-hmm. And this person was, you know, from a very white bred, you know, middle class family. Just, mm. and, and I think those of us who are in, in the suburbs, in your average city in America, are totally disconnected from what life is like from true poor people in Correct. this country. Correct. Uh, you know, and and it's not that you know, like you you just got your job, but you had a period where you didn't have a job mm-hmm. o- over the last year, and it, you know, you didn't have money, but you wouldn't qualify yourself as a poor person right correct yeah no. yeah and so there, there are those times where yeah you're a little light but you aren't living in poverty you know i've never had much money but i've never been living in poverty you know i always had a nice tv i wasn't i i, I found ways to make it right um and this person uh you know it was it was a underage drinking thing basically <sighs> you know and Three cops show up and they start screaming like psychopaths at this teenage girl who's weeping because mm-hmm. she's she's terrified because she's been told by dare officers her entire life, you know, if you do, if you break the law, if you do drugs, you're gonna the, your these, life will be ruined. Your life is ruined. These horrible experiences. So, mm-hmm. you know, the whole time she's at county, she's why are you crying? You're an adult. Quit acting like a baby. It's like, well, maybe if you hadn't been conditioning her for 20 years that this was the worst thing that will ever happen to her, she wouldn't be weeping after you failed 14, after you failed to administer a breathalyzer test, mm. and the, the, then you f- bamboozle her into giving her blood over. You know, I, I mean, it's <sighs> because people don't know their rights. Correct. And and every single step of this process, including the court and you know the police officers are yelling at her. The she gets no time to call her her parents, her lawyer, or anybody. She doesn't even get offered a lawyer. She there's just been this complete dehumanization mm-hmm. at, from the police, the nurses, the court system, and then you hold know, on. The nurse took blood from her while she was intoxicated. Yeah. Well, yeah. <sighs> Right, yeah, it's it's a whole situation. My, can, can you, can, you can't get sent. She's that. like, I don't know if I want to tell you this because I don't want you to judge me. I'm like, I'm a libertarian unless you like lit a child on fire we're, yeah, <laughs> voluntarily. We're... Mm-hmm. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> like, I've heard a lot. Trust me. One of the one of the good and bad parts about doing the show is that people come to me with their stories and they're just unreal. And you know, I'm just sitting there listening to this, thinking, a they. She ended up doing okay because she came from a family that could hire a lawyer, mm-hmm. had the resources to hire the lawyer, and get a lot of the charges dropped. Right. That gap in knowledge between a poor person's family, regardless of race, a poor person's family and my family where we would have the knowledge to hire a lawyer, we would have the resources to hire a lawyer, mm-hmm. we would have the knowledge to say, I'm not talking to you until I get a lawyer. You know, That knowledge gap is really the biggest part of privilege in that communities just aren't there isn't that cultural knowledge or even resources to know what what you have the ability to do i think if you're a poor person a poor white person or a poor black person or a poor hispanic you have the hopelessness of not not being able to afford a lawyer correct so you're not even it's not even an option on the table you're going to take whatever the state gives to you Mm -hmm. and you're going to beg for mercy and hope that they're leaning on you but you never have the concept that you can fight and that to me is a huge psychological difference uh, between, you know, people in my position and Harry's position, uh, you know, a white person and a black person. And you can call that privileged, you can call that whatever you'd like, but I think it's incumbent on us, and, and part of why I am passionate about doing this show is saying, listen, the people in society who don't have the resources that Harry and I have mm-hmm. or the listener that is listening to this show has, yeah. it is part of our responsibility to stand up for those people who don't know or don't have the resources so the state doesn't push them around. Correct. And the state being local, county, federal, whomever, be it Yemenis being bombed by American citizens, our job as libertarians is to stand up for people who don't 
have the knowledge and don't have the resources and say, this is inappropriate. This is not the way that governments are supposed to act. Mm -hmm. This is wholly inappropriate. And you, under the law, are to be given a lawyer, to to have the right to say no to certain acts of invasion. You have a right to not be bullied and dehumanized by police officers and nurses when you're arrested. Uh, and likewise, if you're a white farmer in South Africa, you have a right to not have your land seized by a government. You know, our job as libertarians is to stand up for injustice. And sometimes conservative-leaning libertarians hear that and go, that sounds like SJW nonsense. But justice is a key element mm -hmm. of libertarianism. Yes. Uh, it is... It is our job in a voluntary society or in this society to stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves when you have the resources to stand up for both of you. Mm -hmm. And this is a moment as we read through the story where you ought to think in those terms of justice. We as Americans should advocate for the farmers' rights in South Africa, just as we should advocate for the rights of this young girl, white, black, middle class, rich or poor, to be treated by the state with dignity, mm -hmm. that they have a right to choose. Uh, and so one of the things that I have been obsessed with over the course of my libertarian career, thanks especially to Rupert at Rupert's Kids, uh, I am raising money for Rupert's Kids for my birthday fundraiser. I will put that in the show notes. I'd love for you to donate to Rupert's Kids through my fundraiser. I'm um, trying to raise 500 bucks before my birthday. Uh, and if we go over that, great. They're, they don't take any government charity. You can find out more about them by listening to a past episode of the show with Rupert on it. Um, you know, and I, I was able to see the work that Rupert does in helping people who have gone through the system. And that's when I realized the indignity that people go through at the hands of this government. Uh, and in the bonus episode, we're going to talk about a little, we're going to expand on this. So I want to get back to the African farmers. But I think it's it's important for us to realize, as white people, instead of getting mad about the privilege stuff, and trust me, it irritates me to no end, too, because I'm a person who lives my life by the values of equality and justice and fairness, and indiv every individual has dignity, every individual is deserving of love and respect, and that is regardless of whatever amount of melanin they have or not. Um, you know, jokes aside, jokes are funny, I'm sorry, uh, but at the end of the day, it, 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 it to me doesn't matter your color. Um, and so there's a new term out there, colorist, now means what we grew up thinking racist meant. That if I hate Harry because he's black, I'm a colorist. Okay, but if Harry doesn't fight for uh, injustice in the way that most SJWs argue for injustice and fight against white privilege, then Harry is a racist. Even though Harry is is as black as Harry, uh, then the... Uh, thank you. Uh, it, Harry is a racist because Harry, by being on a libertarian podcast, is, is supporting the institutions of oppression of black men and women everywhere and all people of minorities and, and uh, female gender and non-gendered uh, types. Mm -hmm. So those are the new terms, is that if, if you hate someone because of their color, you're a colorist. If you are anything basically but a liberal, then you're a, a racist because it's an institutional uh, support. Uh, that, that stupid argument, it, 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 it gets so easy to run back into your camp, but we do have to keep in mind when we read stories like this or when we talk about the drug war, when we talk about the criminal justice system, that we are still talking about people that for dozens of generations in this country and in South Africa and in other places around the world were oppressed and were systematically robbed of resources and knowledge and made ignorant on purpose to keep them down, you know? And so what? Nothing. No, keep going. Keep going. Uh, something from the chat? Yeah. It sparked uh, my eye. Sorry. All right. Okay. I, I think I'm done, but I just want to say, like, there is. I'm not. I, I'm not going to say I'm unsympathetic or sympathetic to. I, I guess the word sympathetic to the people who are trying to steal the white man's land in Africa. Like, 
I think if I were a black South African who had been a victim of apartheid and my family's land had been stolen, I probably would have a chip on my shoulder. But using law, lawfare basically, uh, to punish people who have no responsibility for anything is wholly inappropriate. And so you have to have both sides recognize some common, some common arguments. Yes, there were injustices done. Yes, mm-hmm. there are things that society needs to do to correct these imbalances. Yes, you, you want to make all people equal, but you can't do that by making some people less equal by shifting the law to balance out one one group or another. Um, but you do have to have some, you know, some mindfulness that the awareness that we, uh, that I, let me say I, I won't speak for all listeners this time, uh, you know, as somebody who grew up in a an upper middle class white home, had more access to resources and knowledge than a poor white person or a poor black person had. You know, I think Correct. that's and I think that is a lot of times what people on the left are trying to say, but we get so bent out of shape about it because it's wrapped in language that is inherently hostile and demeaning. And so, if you're trying to get someone to stop demeaning somebody, demeaning them doesn't stop their demeaning. And that's the the real breakdown. Am I making any sense? You are, because like you said, the privileged talk language is meant there to be slightly incendiary, to start a conversation, right. to make people rethink or refresh. But I think in the beginning, Donald it, Trump is president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in the beginning, <laughs> it, it probably had some merit, but now it's like, come on, come on, let's bring some nuance to it. We can do it to every other topic. Let's do it to this one too. And some people like to explain like. Granted, the white like some people do explain it well when they say white privilege is just because of, you know, the quick database of people scan when they see a white person. Well, it's it's a white person, so I'm gonna guess these different things right here. And to a lot of people, they attribute a lot of positive thing to white people for some reason. Um, I don't. I see a middle aged white guy. I'm like, oh man, this guy's gonna put me in his car in his basement and make me wear lotion and stuff. You know. Now, all right. Very serious question. Okay, sorry. Um, I mean, you being black, uh-huh. I mean, you have, I don't know if you have mostly white friends, but the friends that I see you talking to are white. Um, I have black friends. I'm sure you do. <laughs> I'm sure your family's black too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. But so, I, I mean, in terms of your experience as a black man, do you see things about the lives of your white friends or even family that you go, wow, there's a gap here? On the, let's see, the only real time I ever saw like a gap between like a, a white friend than versus myself, it was the same way I would see if they were black the same way as that, the wealth difference of what they grew up with. Okay. I have made friends with some very wealthy white people, and I've hearing their grow up style and how they grew up and when they where they went through school. Hearing them talk about going to Burbuff, which is a, a really expensive school here in Indianapolis, and their whole experience of growing up, and it's like wow, that was it's so completely removed from my entire experience of high school and college and just life in general. I was like, that's it, it's it, that's what I don't get, but. If they were black, I would have that that have the exact same thing with the um, bougie side of my family that has a lot, that still has a lot of money that I don't you know I'm removed from that. I was like, okay, that makes no sense, right? You know that um, that's that's what I get. Uh, so it's the exact same thing. Doesn't matter on the you know how much melon in the skin come from. It's to me the class of someone just from but those are just experiences though yeah those are experiences that everyone has i i would probably say the same i have said the same thing about i've got white friends who grew up a lot poorer than i have and i remember going over their houses and seeing how they would lived and it's like wow this is what poor is mm-hmm. whoa yeah like i thought we didn't have a lot of money. Which is why sometimes I hate that people break it down into racism. I mean, my dad ran a janitorial company, and so I grew up, you know, like, I wouldn't say we had a lot of expendable cash, but we had a nice lifestyle when I was a kid until mm-hmm. my parents got divorced, and then that went away. 
Uh, but and then I realized what working poor meant. Yeah. Um. You know, and we went from upper middle class to working poor. Uh. <laughs> in in a couple of years. I mean, so I've been on both ends of this, but. You know, I saw real white poverty when my dad employed people who did janitorial work, Mm -hmm. you know, and going to their houses to drop off checks and, you know, asking dad, like, why is their house so much littler than ours? or Why is it dirtier? Why? You know, so. Yeah. So I always grew up with an awareness that I I was I was fortunate, you know, even Mm -hmm. even in I mean, from the age of 16 to uh last year <laughs> i've been uh fairly low income i mean and but i never felt poor mm. you know and i don't know i don't know how that jives looks, with most people but looks poor to me <laughs> <laughs> one, i know when you I, only have one fireplace <laughs> all right let's get back to south africa so why are we talking about this so as we have talked about with the free speech stuff the general climate and the general tenor of things ultimately ends up leading to legislation. And so the the violence against farmers, the society being okay with that and it and it being kind of a an underground conspiracy theory or mindset uh has led to now legislation proposals. So South Africa has a constitutional republic. Uh, unlike us, they are a unitary constitutional republic. And so from Wikipedia, a unitary state is a state governed as a single power uh, in which a central government is ultimately supreme and any administrative divisions, subnational units, exercise only the powers that the central government chooses to delegate. So imagine that the United States, the Congress was in charge of everything along with the president. And they told the states what to do, and they told the counties what to do. Wouldn't it be weird if that was the system that we lived in, Harry? Very, very weird. Glad we live in a republic. That Glad we live in the upside down, where the states tell the federal government what to do. Uh, ex- so they exercise only the power that the government chooses to delegate. This frightens libertarians, and it should, Hody writes, but I should note that the UK is also a unitary state. Uh, because people are informed and have a degree of power in the UK, the people's right have not been tread upon like they have been in other countries that call themselves unitary. Mm-hmm. So, so, and that's a good point. So the UK is a unitary central authority, but the the tenor of the people, mm-hmm. the mood of the masses, is that they control their government, and so there isn't as much BS that get, that happens as as in South America, uh, South Africa, for instance, or other unitary constitutional republics. And so that's why it's important to have an active citizenry. It's important to have active people people activated into the de- democratic process. Because if you're not, then you allow these central authorities, be it your county, your state, your federal government, the UN, um, public outcry has a tremendous effect on how people operate. You know, the flag went up from half-mast, and then the the cry went out from the people, and Donald Trump put that flag back down uh, at half-mast for John McCain. I mean, you think about selling the ports uh, years ago. Um, uh, Here's a good one. Closing Guantanamo Bay and putting prisoners in the United States prisons, in, in New York specifically. And the people of New York and people around the country freaked the F out, and they stopped Barack Obama from closing down Guantanamo Bay. He chickened out, uh, not going into Libya in a in a hardcore way, uh, or invading Syria uh, after the gas attack, after the red line comment. These are instances of government of public outcry stopping the federal government, for instance, from doing certain things. And so, if you don't like your f- speech being censored or you don't like your guns being taken away or you don't like your fourth amendment privacy is being invaded or you don't like any of your rights being eroded then say something and don't just put it on facebook show up somewhere send thank you (laughs) um so the government is always going to do what the government does which is try and steal your rights correct it's what state is going to do what state is going to do doesn't matter if it's the politician that you know and liked and you volunteered in his campaign it, 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 whether he is intentionally doing it or not, he is actively moving it away to steal your rights. If they can, they will. That's right. Um, you know, so people have to fear uprisings in their government. So, in South Africa, a bill 
uh, was being theoretically discussed at the beginning of this year. Uh, the Independent writes, Last month's motion in Parliament over land redistribution was proposed by the firebrand leader of the economic freedom fighters, Julius Malema, who, was, who has gained notoriety for his outspoken views towards South Africa's white population and has previously been convicted of hate speech for singing the apartheid-era struggle song, Shoot the Boar. Boar is Dutch for farmer. Mr. Malema has described land seizures as teaching whites a lesson and wants ownership to closer reflect South Africa's population, where 80.2% 80 80 of, of the people describe themselves as black, 8.4% white, and 8.8% as colored, meaning a mix or something else. Um, uh, for the first part of the, the year, this bill was just basically a rumor, but then last month it became a reality, and the BBC writes, South Africa will push ahead with plans to amend the Constitution to allow land expropriation without compensation. Its president says in a record in a recorded address, President Cyril Rapaphosa said that the ruling ANC party will finalize a proposed amendment allowing the move. He said the reform was of critical importance to the economy. You heard that right. The bill is proposed is basically going to take people's land and take it away from them without any compensation. Uh, so here in America, we do that. We call it imminent, imminent domain, but we do pay you market price for stealing your property. Um, but here they're not going to even pay you. So you will wake up one day and one night you will go to bed and the next morning you wake up and you will have no home. Go ahead. I'm just thinking like, so Zimbabwe 2018. Oh, sorry. Right. Yeah, this is New Zimbabwe. So this, this is... Uh, this is going to get awful. This is something from the fringes of South Africa that the fringes are loud and so... The fringe movements persuaded politicians that they that this is what should be done, and now there's backlash because the majority of the country is against it, and so now they're kind of backpedaling. Um, so there is uh, a large scale. So they're going to have hearings basically, and who knows if these are hearings? They're going to have public hearings around the country, and and have listening sessions. Which I'm sure will be like American listening sessions, where the the local government holds hearing sessions. Fourteen old white people show up with signs screaming mm -hmm. "boomer" things, mm -hmm. and then the government does whatever they want to do. And then when somebody complains, well, we had listening sessions. We had sessions. Did you show up to the sessions? We made sure to have them during your work day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to one of these listening sessions and watched a politician's mind be changed. Um. So they could be changed in committee. Right, right, exactly right. <laughs> Enough money, you can change it. So negative press may seem innocuous, but it can easily lead to a popular outcry for sanctions or even military actions against the country from other nations if somebody like Trump gets involved. And this wouldn't be the first time that the American government toppled someone in South Africa. Uh, we have been involved. We we have we were instrumental. The CIA was instrumental in putting Nelson Mandela in jail. So all of the bull around how Americans love Nelson Mandela and what a freedom fighter, it was your CIA with your tax dollars that tipped off the uh, South African government that put him in jail. Uh, so that's just one of the times that we have toppled, helped topple the government in South Africa. Um, so from the Independent, speaking this week, President Rafafosa said his government would not support or allow violent land grabs against the white-owned farms of the kind which led to Zimbabwe's economic collapse 20 years ago, calling this anarchy. He also he has also specified he will consider re rewording the bill so that safety and or compensation might be provided. So you'll hear a lot of conversation about Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe basically did the same thing 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the uh, this is like classic libertarian stuff right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So what happened in Zimbabwe? These two questions uh, are linked with you know wouldn't people benefit from a land grab? Uh, Zimbabwe tried this very same kind of land reform technique in 1980 and took the country from a place where they were considered average by most metrics and brought them to a place they are now, which is one of the most impoverished countries in the world. For a time, it was actually the single most impoverished country in the world. From the Cato Institute, they write, uh, throughout the first decade of the 21st century, Zimbabwe became Exhibit A 
on how to wreck a national economy. The Mugabe government sees thousands of large-scale commercial farms without compensating the landlords who held the property titles. As a result, there was a cascading set of economic failures despite the agricultural sector commanding only 15% of the economy. Property titles for farms became worthless, and hundreds of banks holding the deeds went out of business because mortgage payments were no longer being made. Hundreds of retail and commercial businesses dependent upon the farming sector also failed, and the government tax revenue rapidly shrank as a result, creating enormous budget deficits. The government filled the gap by printing money, resulting in hyperinflation. So you remember the Zimbabwe currency was like, mm -hmm. they, they, it was worth less than the paper it was being printed on. Correct. And yeah. they couldn't print it fast enough. Mm hmm so and and everybody wanted to get Zimbabwe notes because it was like a it's, collector's item. Yeah, it was goofy. Yeah, like it was like a huge thing in libertarian circles for the longest time. It was like, oh, look at my trillion Zimbabwe dollar. You know? Well, it was also happening during the bailout, and so everybody oh, yeah. was like, "This is your future. This uh -huh. is what's going to happen in the future." And it still might, but it still might. Yeah, it, still it, might. I, I, Luckily, I, everything else has been suppressed worse. Right. It's the only thing that's holding it back. So the people who like who are in the resistance right now, and everything's terrible, and this is the worst. In 2008, I stopped paying my credit card bills because I was so convinced because of the rhetoric of the anti-Obama Tea Party crowd over the next couple of years. I stopped, I think it was 2009. I was just convinced that we were imminently going to collapse. I had read all the Tom Woods books. I had listened to all the Ron Paul speeches. I had become a gold bug. I was like, you know what, I'm not even going to pay these credit card bills because within a year or two, we're going to hit hyperinflation. The government's going to collapse. And, and I completely bought all of it. And guess what didn't happen? The collapse. The, the only thing that collapsed was my credit score. <laughs> okay, so, so when everybody is running around, oh, the government's about to have hyperinflation, and, uh, you know, Ron Paul's constantly, the neocons are causing hyperinflation, I'm like... Yeah, dude, that didn't work on me. That worked on me 10 years ago, but I'm a little wiser now. And, you know, people who are getting involved in politics for the first time after 2016 who are anti-Trump, they're really scared. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I remember being really scared when Barack Obama first got elected. And you know what happened? Not much. Yeah, not much. Right. So pay your bills, calm down, and be a grown-up. Yeah, pay your bills off, pay your bills down, get out of debt. These are good things to do. That's right. If you're really scared of a collapse... Get out of debt. Get cash. Get solid currency. If you have the chance to get some gold and some silver on hand, do that. Okay? Ponies. Yeah. And ponies. Do not forget your pony. Okay? Because the pony economy is coming. Okay? Vermin Supreme will be president. So this is a great example of in South Africa where people who want to level the playing field by using the government and just taking things, you don't actually end up leveling the playing field. The only playing field that you level is that everybody in the society ends up poor. Oh, yeah. Could you imagine being one of those uh, landowners? Even though they're having these hearings and starting to walk back, my first move is trying to get my British passport or finding another country to go to and selling my property. I'm getting the heck out, and I'm not paying my mortgage payment. Right. Because they're going to take it from me anyways. So I'm taking all my money and getting the heck out of there. Right. It's, yeah, you, yeah, you get out. And it's like, oh, we're going to backpedal. No, I'm out. I'm out. I'm cashing out. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. So. Just leave. If you want to know more about Zimbabwe's collapse in the show notes, that uh, there's a PDF of show notes that are attached. Uh, so if you want, you know, the Hody commentary, the links that we use, all that stuff. All in the show notes that you can uh, look in your little podcatcher description or go to wearelibertarians.com. And I will say every day in the Chris Spangle Show post, there is a roundup of news and articles and all kinds of great stuff. So make sure that you check that every day. Every day. Best yet, if you don't want to forget, just get the email newsletter every night at 9 o'clock. We're going to send you a link to everything that happened on wearelibertarians.com that day, all the podcasts, all that good stuff. So, um. Uh, so, uh, why why are we talking about this? Well, Donald Trump, Streisand affected it, mm -hmm. and everybody is talking about the South Africa stuff, and uh, it's one of those things where if you're in the libertarian e echo chamber... Ecosystem. E ecosystem. You hear about the South Africa stuff, but you don't know what you're supposed to believe. You don't know, like, uh, like obviously, a government taking people's land is a very bad thing. And it's going to lead to economic collapse. Mm -hmm. It's it's not only economically foolish, it's also morally wrong. Correct. So 
But I will I will ask this. I mean, Harry, how do we reconcile the fact that some of these lands, not all, but some, were stolen to begin with? Hundreds of gen- yeah, generations ago, hundreds of years ago, those people who stole those lands are dead and gone. Right. And and some of these lands were homesteaded. So why why should the why should the future generations of uh, of the thieves get to live on the land when the hun- when the hundreds of generations later should get the land back? I mean, wh- who wh- said? Who even knows if these wh- black people that are there they're the original landowners that were there when the British arrived? Right. You know, tribes and people have moved in and conquered nations and moved into areas for. How old is your six thousand years? Six thousand years or so. It's just something that happens. We can we can try to correct and heal from the things of the past and not do those bad things. Right. But we cannot go out and just start t- taking land that people are actively using and and just give it to someone just because. Well, your tribe had this two hundred years ago. Here you go. Yeah. Now, if they're not actively doing anything with that land, you know, and they want to, you know, it's like, okay, so, you, you know, you're pretty much abandoned. You're not doing anything about it. You can probably, you know, if the landowner wants to sell, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. But if they're actively using this, doing something with this land or just wanting to own their land, then they're so far, they're about as removed from the bad deeds that the conquering British are than you are from your ancestors being trampled upon from that land being taken. Right. <laughs> yes, it sucks. It's awful. But I bet dollars to donuts your ancestors conquered somebody that was sitting there in the first place. Could have been penguins. I don't know. So uh, it just sparked my memory. The Gracchi reform, the Gracchus brothers, and land reform in the Roman Republic where they basically took... Um, uh, they basically stole land from rich people and gave it to the commons, mm-hmm. and it completely collapsed the republic of the Roman Empire into Caesar becoming their dictator. Uh, so this is this is just another. Th- there's a great book about this called "Storm Before the Storm" by Mike Duncan, who did the Ooh. History of Rome podcast, and uh, he basically outlines the last 150 years of the Roman Republic. And central to the fall of the Roman Republic was these land reforms that Tiberius Gracchus introduced as a way to basically, it was the same exact play. It was a demagogue politician promising poor people land stolen from the rich people who were causing their misery, supposedly. Uh, And so it was, it's a very good book. Uh, I will put that in the... Um, in the in the show post link, and if you click on that, it'll be it'll if you buy it, it gives us credit. I just added that to my cart through my We Libertarians link. <clears throat> That's right. So Amazon, uh, WeLibertarians dot com slash support, and you can access our Amazon link. And so every time you purchase something through Amazon, we get the credit for it. So if you buy this book, then please do that through our Amazon link, and. Uh, then we get a commission based off of the Washington Post, Jeff Bezos, Amazon.com people, yeah. and it costs you nothing. So uh, so now the president, he teased out white genocide, and white genocide is something that is co- commonly talked about in this subject. Uh, and, and I think every libertarian, I was listening to Glenn Beck the other day, and they were doing a, uh, a survey on this, and they they'd put some of their research staff on it. And they said, we had every intention of finding white genocide taking place in South Africa, but every time we followed the threads, it ended up back at this one group kind of pushing this narrative. So, you know, every time you pull on some narrative, you end up with media matters, for instance. So the so the South African media matters is basically pushing this narrative that uh, that there is, is uh, a systemic organized violence against white farmers in South Africa. And that's just, it's not that it's not true. You're unable to prove that's true because of the way that statistics are reported. Now, violence is up against farmers, but violence is up against everyone in South Africa. They're going through a serious crime spike. Um, So the independent rights... (laughs) Uh, Since the beginning of 2018, when they started mulling this bill over, people realized the government was on their side and started attacking whites. Independent is a British newspaper. Activist groups promoting the rights of white people in the country claim there have been 90 recorded attacks in 2018 so far, with one farmer murdered every five days on average. 
There is no official data supporting the idea that white farmers are more likely to be victims of attacks in South Africa. And the government strongly denies white people are being deliberately targeted and says farm murders are part of South Africa's wider violent crime problem. The problem is you can't confirm or deny anything um, because, I mean, if you if you look at some of these stories, they're very horrific crimes. You know, the, the theft and the violence ends up turning into murder and rape. Um, and you, you can't discount the actual stories coming from people. Right. You know, and there is clearly a crime spike taking place. But one problem is that they discontinued keeping stats on why. So, like, theft is massively up in South Africa because of increased poverty. Mm-hmm. But they stopped attributing to, they, they stopped recording motive in crimes in South Africa. So they no longer keep statistics on what caused people to commit the crime they committed. And so you can't go back and look and say, this was a racially motivated crime. This was just a theft that turned into a murder. So from a macro perspective, you can't prove that white genocide is taking place. Um, But obviously, crime is up against whites, and nobody can really get a good handle on whether or not it is a systemic targeting of white farmers or if it is just a coincidence that is being grabbed by certain advocacy groups and then presented that way. True. So, so yeah. Um, so they just stop recording data. They just like, ah, we don't need that motive thing. That, who knows? That's happened here in America too. That's true. Um, so I know we're sitting in a city that like got rid of their, uh, vehicle theft division and saw a massive spike in car thefts in the two years since it, the division's been gone. So Right. So. It's exactly right. <laughs> Who am I to criticize? I'm, I'm sure there's some political correctness bullcrap as to why they don't do that anymore. Probably. Yeah, just like Sweden and Britain. They've got, right. you know, they've, they've got rules on it or something. Or it just looks bad in the macro. So Donald Trump... As expected, Donald Trump took a long time to carefully study the issues, mm-hmm. had his research team on it. Uh, thought, you know, he he got in his slack with his researchers and said, you know what, I want to know about South South Africa. Before I go onto Twitter, I want to know exactly what's happening so I can present to people the truth. That's not what Donald Trump did. <laughs> I know you're surprised. I I am shocked. I have asked Secretary of State. Pompeo to closely study the South Africa land from farm seizures and expropriations and the large-scale killing of farmers. Uh, so, South African government is now seizing land from white farmers at Tucker Carlson at Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> Tagging his bros in there. Uh, so, I think that means he was probably watching Tucker Carlson and wanted Tucker to know he was watching, so that's mm-hmm. why he uh, he did that. Um, Notice me, Simba. Yeah. So, so yeah. It's it's he he doesn't have all the facts. He believed the media. Like as I've said before, if you're watching, even Tucker, who is good a lot of the times, except on immigration, uh, is if you're watching television news, you're having your intelligence assaulted. Yeah, pretty much. You, you should only get your news from the libertarians. It's right. the only source of news you need. It's really and, and the Brian Nichols show. There's really like nothing else you need because I'm doing I'm doing the work of 15 people here. Yeah. So uh, so check that out. Um, so I mean, d- have you learned anything different about the South African situation? I learned about the whole them not keeping the motive. Now that makes sense why it's really hard to research and but I haven't done that for a while because like right now. It, from every bit of research before that, even that for a while, they just said, no, violence is just, just against farmers. It's it's who they have attacked. But in that country, that's where, you know, it's, it's kind of, that's, you know, it's a cash cow. Right. You know, they're wealthy and they get attacked. You know, they get mugged. Well, I think that it, it, in the future, I'm not going to be surprised to see South Africa devol- Ugh, devolve. 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 Uh, devolve into something very serious. Probably. Because I think they have, you know, anytime you elect a government that wants to just steal land from people and is propping up their little 
sister party. Basically, the ANC is propping up this, you know, freedom party mm -hmm. to basically be their hatchet men because they don't want to do it. Um, and they're encouraging and emboldening, you know, this this radical person who's basically a racist who wants to kill white people. Mm -hmm. So I think I think if you're a white person in South Africa, and I actually know I have a Twitter friend who's in South Africa, and I've talked with her. I'm like, like, are you getting out? So, um, and they're like, Ugh. so, I, I mean, I would be concerned. Yeah, I'd look at it and go, I really don't think we should stay here. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're 19. 33 Germany. Yeah. But at this point, you can't, from America sitting here, you can't tell what's going on. And it doesn't look like if you're in South Africa, you can really tell what's going on. But the conditions don't look good. When your government starts thinking you're not people and they can take your stuff, that's usually not a good condition. Without compensation. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Explicit. It was like, it wasn't even like they were hiding the, oh, we may pay. Right. No, we ain't paying. No, we right. wrote that down that we ain't paying. So, all right. This segment was brought to you by our Patreon. Thank you for joining us here on the show. Uh, long ago, opinion journalism only existed in newspapers and magazines, but the internet has given rise to new voices like We Are Libertarians. Few people are doing what we do, giving a libertarian opinion on modern life and politics in a fun and entertaining way. We here at We Are Libertarians are building something special, but we cannot do it without your help. We are hiring freelancers, building up our website, planning to grow into the largest libertarian voice in America by 2020 during that election. I know it's going to happen, and we can't do it without your help, and that takes tools and resources. Uh, we, we need you to join with us, become a citizen at $5 a month, and get our bonus content, CD quality and commercial-free shows, before anybody else. At $10, if you join the nobility then you get access to an exclusive Facebook group and a notification to join the live stream and chat with us during the show. Members of the Royal Court at $25 get a poster and free shipping in the new We Are Libertarian store. And you can also join the Emperor's Circle at $100 a month. And you get to sit in on our co-host strategy calls, which are coming soon, thanks to Harry Price. Private access to Dear Leader himself. And a guest spot on the show after a couple months. So please join now at wearelibertarians.com slash support or at patreon.com slash wearelibertarians. Special thanks to Craig DaCosta, Brandon Luke, Jason Doolittle, Christy Avery, Paul Jonathan Eads Jr., and the Liberty Coalition for the Libertarian Coalition for being members of the $100 a month Emperor's Circle. <laughs>